Now you have in front of you uh, three journalists who have really proven themselves in the investigative journalist field. Uh, Ritu, I think, wins in terms of quantity. The list that goes on and on and on <laughs> in, the, in, in uh, the number of investigations you've done is quite remarkable. Uh, Michael Resendez is in-depth uh, reporting. I think you all have now uh, are familiar with from the film Spotlight, as well as uh, articles that have numerous articles and interviews that you might have seen or read about Michael on his um, expose. He was part of a team that exposed the uh, priests involved in sexual abuse in the Catholic Church, which was worldwide. Ritu Serene's most recent one, I think, uh, is the Panama uh, paper. So we'll get into that. And um, Neha Dixit got herself in a lot of trouble <laughs> with just uh, one story, and uh, that became uh, very controversial. So we'll get into that also. Uh, Ritu, let's start with you. Um, how did you how did you get into the you were part of a group an international group that were working on these papers could you explain to the audience how it happened actually i was going through some of my old files the other day and i realized that i've been a member of the icij that is the international consortium of investigative journalists for 18 years now so, so that's why you have such a long list. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, so I'm just saying, I, I'm, I'm quite an old hand at the organization. Uh, ICIJ has also changed somewhat now, and that is instead of doing independent stories, they prefer to team up with media organizations, like in my case with the Indian Express, because a project may require you to be working at it for six months. Now, I can't take leave for six months and work on an ICIJ project. Mm. So they tie up with media organizations. And uh, this is the third offshore project I've done with them, which means you're in a deep tunnel. Uh, you know, if you're working on one story for eight months, you're not meeting people, you're not going out, your byline is missing. Uh, and I'm sure there'll be more. First of all, when you, when you got the papers, you were one of many around the world. 200. 200, and you had to comb through looking for names. Was there an element where you had to get in touch with those people to get their side of the story or confirmation? So I just want to tell you that it's not so simple as they give us static data and we look for names and we check the addresses, go for a comment, and out is Panama Papers. It's much, much more painstaking. And there is a lot of backup sort of software they give you, you know, where you can link companies and thousands and thousands of documents have to be scanned. And a document may lead you to an attachment which will lead you to more, which will, may lead you to a document which is hundreds of pages, you know? Uh, so it, it is just much more than just data and names. And so when you uh, do come across yeah. a famous so, name, yeah. do, you, do you feel uh, duty bound to call them up or get in touch with them in some way? Yeah, ask? so the guidelines, the deadline, even the deadline for when we can approach the subject is preset. You know, we have a date after which we can approach the people we are writing about. So the world over 200 people will be speaking to subjects of the investigation. And uh, we do not speak to anyone before that. And that also is very painstaking because like for example, the Indian Express has a huge network of state correspondents. So for this story, we, I think there must have been 30, 35 reporters who are all over the country uh, knocking on doors. And we only write about those people uh, whose address we have been able to confirm. Now, if it's a celebrity, Aishwarya Rai, you have an address, you don't, if the address is correct and you know where she lives, you don't need to go, you know, and even check it out. But uh, let me give you an example. Uh, the other day, uh, Mehrasan Jewelers was raided by the uh, Enforcement Directorate as a result of Panama Papers. Mm. We just had an address, and there were a lot of Mehras on the data we had. And when I went to the house in Panchil Park, uh, there were about half a dozen guards, and they won't tell me who lives there. Twice I went, and they just, you know, it was just one of those situations. So I went back and said, I'm, I'm making a directory of Panchil Park, you know, kiska ghar hai ye. That's when I got to know 
uh, they are the jewelers. You so really look like a person who's making a directory of Yeah, so what I mean to say is sometimes, sorry, I didn't, yeah? I said you really look like a person who's making a, dire ah. a directory of Panchipa. <laughs> so what I mean you to say like is... You look like a journalist, how yeah. did you pull them? So even to get an address or to get the identity is really uh, sometimes difficult. I traced a politician, I remember very close to my house in Gautam Nagar. Uh, the house was closed, I had to go to the neighbor. And he said, you don't know if you are old You know, that kind of thing. Hmm. So it, it is a building block of getting to know the identities and then approaching them. But when those names came up, such as Aishwarya Rai, <coughs> do you feel that you should get in touch with her? We uh, not only get in touch, uh, we are very clear that getting in touch is not a perfunctory kind of exercise that you make a, one phone call and forget about it. Uh, it is our own due diligence. We are required to leave a trail of emails, of SMSs and repeated requests uh, for information and as time passes, if there is no response, then you put it down that this is what I'm doing, this is the story, we need your comments. You did get some responses, didn't you? Most responses. Yes. A uh, vast majority of people did respond. Uh, again, in the case of Aishwarya Rai, we got a response from her uh, media advisor, I think she said, yeah, what is this ICIJ? Anyway. Uh, vast majority of people responded. More like a legal response, as I recall. It was... Uh, uh, some people will drop off a written response to the office. Some people will reply to emails. Some people are okay with it on the telephone. Uh, but yeah, people... And some people will respond through their CAs because it's very technical so also. how long did you work on this on this? Eight particular? months. And, and uh, not, only, not only me, a uh, full team. How many? Three. So, Michael worked on... Uh, his expose for one year, right? One year or two years? Was it? Well, it was closer to two years. Two we years and a million dollars. That's correct, yeah. Now, how much does it cost Indian Express to do an investigative story like this? No, it just costs the Indian Express our salaries. Uh, no, but what about traveling to the places where to check addresses, to, to wait for the res uh, responses, all that, I mean, that, that is also involved. Yeah, so as I said, we used our entire network, our state mm -hmm. correspondents, and of course they have to take cabs and they have to, you know, uh, if it's Andhra Pradesh, then it could be any part of Andhra Pradesh, and all over the country, this exercise goes on. Uh, it costs the Indian Express our salaries because we are doing nothing else, mm -hmm. and we do have to face very impatient editors because in the middle they do get impatient, okay, no other story coming. Yeah. And uh, then there are conferences, uh, there's, there's uh, a mid-course project meeting uh, uh, somewhere in the world. Uh, this time it was in Europe, and uh, for which the paper has to pay. But yesterday somebody asked a question of Michael uh, that our news organizations in India do not have the kind of money to support the kind of investigation that the Spotlight team did. Now, um, Indian Express in fact does a huge amount of uh, exposés, um, not saying the only one who does, but you certainly are in the forefront in the print. The answer Michael gave yesterday was that you don't have to do investigations that take a year or six months. You can also look at stories that can be done in two weeks or six weeks. Have you done, done those kind of stories, Michael? I've done investigations that take uh, six weeks or, or six months or a year. Uh, and there are, there are stories that can be turned around really quickly. Sometimes you get a, a, a tip about a, a lawsuit that's been filed that's got some interesting information in it, and it's really a matter of uh, getting the lawsuit, reading the complaint, contacting the people involved, and, and uh, reading the story. Uh, you know, uh, as I said before, uh, I do believe that there are many important investigative stories to be done that will take less than a year. I mean, Panama Papers is an exceptional case. Uh, our investigation into the Catholic Church, that was an exceptional case. Uh, most investigations probably don't take a year. I'd just like to give two uh, very quick examples, two more, uh, more stories. Of course, those are also in-depth and long-term, but they are staggered in the sense we didn't have to work on them. The paper didn't have to work with them uh, uh, full throttle. Uh, we decided to uh, spend a year reporting a particular district uh, in a country, uh, Nagrampur, in Urissa. And we sent six reporters over the course of a year. You know, uh, uh, one, it, our agriculture editor went, our features editor went, then our business editor went, you know, just, just to cover one of the poorest districts of the country uh, from an from, uh, investigative uh, viewpoint. Then the other was a story my team did, which was on the Jandhan accounts 
uh, introduced by this government. For that too, my, uh, my colleagues went all over the country. And the idea was to show if the government is claiming that there is money in every Jandhan account, the accounts are not empty. Uh, we reported throughout, spoke to people, got their comments on how overzealous bankers had put one rupee and two rupee deposits in the Jandhan account. And then we spoke to dozens of people all over the country who said, Hameni pata ye paise kisne daale hai. So tell me, Ritu, uh, what kind of pressures have you experienced to kill a story, whether it's corporate or government, or personal, in fact, that's the most terrible one to deal yeah. with. I can't talk about all, and... Um, Okay, let's ask it another I, way. I, Did you, um, were you forced I can, to? I can say with pride, uh, and I've been with the paper for 20 years now, that I don't think uh, ever an important story uh, was killed. Not, yeah. And um, there are pressures, but the thing is also um, in my paper, and I hope in other places too, it's good to insulate the reporter from the pressures till the story comes out. Mm. And even after the story comes out, the reporter does not need to know about every phone call and pressure. Mm. You know, and certainly not when he or she is working on the story. Because, uh, you know, that does not unnerve you, but it unsettles you. But in India, you get direct calls, don't you? Uh, get? Direct calls to kill a of story. Of course you do. You, not only you, the reporter, uh, yeah. not, on, not only you, it could be uh, people the caller perceives uh, is close to you. It could be a friend, it could be a colleague, and of course, it could be your bosses. Michael, have you experienced those kind of pressures to kill a story? Well, I have. Uh, my colleagues on the Spotlight team very recently did. I, I was not involved in, in this story, but I think it's worth talking about. Uh, my colleagues uh, did an expose of the biggest hospital in, in Boston. It's one of the most, Massachusetts General Hospital. Oh, okay. It's one of the most famous medical institutions in the world. And what was happening is uh, the surgeons were conducting more than one surgery at a time, two surgeries at once, and uh, they were not telling the patients. So the patients thought, well, this is my doctor. He's going to be present throughout the entire surgery. That was not the case. Doctor was going back and forth uh, between two surgeries and having uh, assistants uh, do a lot of the work. And some of these uh, surgeries were botched. So it was a very important uh, investigation and uh, there was enormous pressure uh, put on the, the Boston Globe to kill this story. Uh, the people who run this hospital are very wealthy, very powerful, very influential, and uh, there were many, many calls and many meetings with editors. The, the, the pressure, I think, was enormous. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, the Spotlight team published the story and found out that this was happening at uh, hospitals all over the United States, and as a result, the the society that regulates surgeons changed their regulations to prevent this practice. So at the end of the day, we persisted, we told the story, and the regulations were changed, uh, the, the practice has been curtailed, but the pressure to kill the story was really significant. Uh, how did you prove that one surgeon was going back and forth? Well, there were, we had, there were some lawsuits filed, so some of the okay. allegations were on the record, and also there was a whistleblower uh, one of the most famous and senior surgeons uh, at, the, at the hospital was a source. And uh, we talked about how to protect sources, and this is, this is very, very important. In this particular case, uh, the source was fired. Now, as it turned out, <clears throat> this, is a, this is a man who was uh, at the end of his career, uh, probably quite well off, and also he understood the risks and he was willing to take that risk. And it was, a, it was something that was discussed with him at length. But at the, the hospital was so intent on killing the story when they, uh, that before the story ran, they fired the doctor because they knew that he was a source. So they were really doing everything possible to prevent this from getting in the paper. Uh, Neha, uh, when your story came out about these young girls who were taken from the Northeast and put in a school, uh, in Punjab, you faced a lot of flack on the social media, on I did not know you at that time and I inadvertently defended you and then we got to know each other after that. But I had no idea who you were but I found that the story was so remarkable and the kind of hatred and diatribes and really personal violence stuff 
that you had to face. Now, when you ran the story before, when it, before it was published, before it was published, how did your editor deal with it? They must have been aware that this, there's going to be a fallout because it is a story uh, connected with uh, the party in power. Just to give a background about people, about the story, because some people may be unfamiliar with it. So, uh, what initially happened was because I have covered child trafficking quite a bit for the last 10, 12 years, uh, I found out that certain Hindu nationalist organizations, in this case RSS affiliated organizations, had taken away uh, 31 girls from uh, certain districts in the Northeast, especially in Assam, and they were taken to Punjab and they were taken to Gujarat, and the parents were told that the girls are being taken away to be put in schools for formal education. But uh, when I got this information, uh, the first thing before even pitching to the editor was to be able to have evidence to say that something like this is, hap is, going, is happening because the, uh, it is concerned with the party in power and there may be lots of ramifications for it. And that is the first thing that was uh, very essential for me was apart from interviews from people on the ground and parents of these 31 girls saying that the girls have been taken away but we've not been able to speak to our girls for the last one year. There's no way we can get in touch with them. All the documents, all the identity papers, their photographs even have been taken away by these RSS affiliated organizations. And then I found out that the local uh, government statutory bodies like the Assam State Commission for the Protection of Child Rights, the Child Welfare District Committee, and uh, uh, Childline India, which is affiliated to uh, the Ministry of Women and Child Development, have on paper said that this is child trafficking and this is in violation of the Juvenile Justice Act. So before even pitching to the editor, it was very important for me to procure those documents. And when uh, I got access to those documents is when I made the final pitch to the editor. And just adding to the previous point that was there, that a lot of times what works in my favor as an independent journalist is that there have been many instances when I've pitched stories to editors and I've filed the story and after filing the story, one organization or the sec uh, some organization has refused to carry that story because of their various uh, pressures or uh, things that they don't want to get in conflict with. And then as soon as they withdraw, I pitch it to some other organization and the, eventually the story does come out. So uh, that works in my favor to not be part of the system. Now we have experienced, uh, not only with the existing government, but the previous governments also, that um, very often uh, pressure is brought on not only the editor, but the owners, the, the business people who own the news organization. Um, Ritu happens to come from a tradition where the owner stood up against the government, against Indira Gandhi, but not all owners are uh, inclined to do so or able to do so even if they want to, um, because one has to, one, have very deep pockets to fight an, uh, a government, and secondly, you have to have uh, the, your own closets have to be very clean, and you, if you're going to have raids happening in your offices all over the country, as many news organizations do, it's not an easy thing to do. Now, Michael, tell me, we in our country deal with these pressures all the time. Does it happen in America? Because I was in America when Watergate happened. I saw Kay Graham being quite comfortable with publishing it. New York Times was quite publishing, uh, comfortable with the Pentagon Papers. Um, there was no fallout. Here, there is a fallout. Well, in the United States, uh, there is also fallout. I think in the United States, uh, there's less pushback when you go, uh, when you investigate a government agency, uh, because your right to documents is much more clear cut. Uh, and the government agency works in the public realm. Uh, however, when we go uh, investigate a corporation or a private entity, then the pushback can be quite significant. As I said, when we investigated Massachusetts General Hospital, the pushback was very significant, and I should add that the 
owner of the Boston Globe sits on the board of directors of that hospital. So he was, he was getting the phone calls. Uh, he was getting as many phone calls uh, as the editor was and, and many other people who were at the newspaper. So I think when a, when a newspaper goes after, in the United States goes after uh, a corporation, investigates a, an entity that uh, is richly endowed with resources, there is going to be pushback and the possibility of, we get threatened with libel suits all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, once in a while somebody files one and we have to go to court to defend ourselves and that's very costly, uh, but we're threatened with libel suits quite often. So uh, have you had any uh, defamation suits filed against you? Personally, I think I've only had one in my entire career, and uh, it, it didn't really amount to much. It was dismissed. It never, it never went to trial. How about you, Ritu? Have you dealt with uh, any defamation suits, libel suits? Oh, um, actually, to my name also, I have just I have had one, and that was filed in Punjab. Uh, it was dismissed, but it took eight years. And but I had to, I had to go for many notices because those are very oh, interesting. Very often, like the other day, uh, no, not the other day, uh, some time ago, uh, I went to meet, specifically meet someone in Bombay. Uh, he promised me his version. I met him on a Friday. He promised me the version on Monday. Instead of that, you have a legal notice. One, two, three. You know, that's very unfair. But besides that, that is the stage to bring in the legal advisors of your group. That is the stage to make sure that uh, your legal advisors have vetted your copy because then the ball is in their court. In all probability, you are going to get a lawsuit. Well, legal notices are basically a threat. It's not actually a suit yet. Yes, I think... So uh, you are, you're given a chance to rectify whatever mistake. What are you saying, Michael? I don't know if Mike can put a percentage to it, but I think a very large percentage of uh, uh, legal uh, notices do not end in cases. I would agree with that. I think it's, it's usually a threat and the, and the lawsuit is never filed. I will add that I think your best defense against a libel suit is to be accurate in your reporting and to have everything documented. The libel suits that I've seen proceed to trial, in those cases there have often been questions about the reporting. Maybe there were some uh, minor factual inaccuracies that encouraged the person who was the subject of the investigation to file the lawsuit. Or perhaps there were legitimate questions. Perhaps uh, the article was not as thoroughly researched as it should have been. So I think the best defense against libel is to be really accurate, document everything as much as you can, and uh, just, do a great, just do a great job with your story. And you'll get threats, but I bet at the end of the day no one will file. I think there's, um, it's still in a gray area in India about truth as defense for defamation. Is that, am I right? that if you prove that it's true, then it's not. Is, is there a lawyer in the house? <laughs> no. Somebody wants to enlighten us on this? Bolo? Uh, criminal defamation uh, includes within the criminal code itself, for example, and truth as a defense. Uh, there is no truth as a defense. 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 By, you, have to, you have to be able to prove that you are doing this in the public interest. So even if it's absolutely true, if, uh, because even true things can ruin someone's reputation, you have to be able to show that you're doing it because it's in the public interest. And you have to be able to have, make a compelling case for that. Neha, you I just wanted to add a point, which is that, for instance, my story, uh, it's now, and this pattern is kind of increasing that whenever an investigative story is published or any story is published that makes some people uncomfortable, I think mostly the pattern was to file a defamation case or some kind of that kind of case. But what now happens is that some other criminal case is filed against me. Like the case ag filed against me after the story is uh, of inciting communal hatred amongst communities. And that's like a serious charge. So, and the thing is that because all the documents were in place, they did not counter any of the facts given in the story. But, you know, this is a method to harass people to file completely unrelated case, and which is why now this kind of pattern has increased. If one sees in like smaller towns in India, it's not defamation that is filed against journalists, it's some other criminal charge that they're implicated in. So but Neha, I think if you could tell us, I think, tell the audience, your experience after your story was published, because you faced a lot of harassment, and how did your organize, how did Outlook magazine deal with it? Uh, including so, the legal issues. So after the story was published, uh, initially everybody was reading it, and uh, then 
came the news that the uh, the organization, because I was not an employee of the organization, the story was published in Outlook. Uh, we got to know that the management has changed the editor, replaced the editor with somebody else. And this was completely, uh, the timing was a little questionable because uh, nobody had countered what we had put out in the story. But at the same time, the re re this act of replacing the editor was also kind of a message to the people in power that, okay, we are trying to do something about it. Also, the other thing was that, so it's, it's like the same thing, you know, each time, and it's not just uh, limited to me, everybody, all journalists sitting here have faced some kind of online trolling and it's kind of funny also sometimes when a woman is involved. Somebody tweeted a picture of me with my partner saying that, who is this man in Neha Dikshit's bedroom payment in cash or finance, which clearly they do not do any background check when they put out these uh, things. Or they say stuff like, you know, uh, uh, concubine of Rahul Gandhi or the wife of a lashkar e -Toyba leader, which is kind of, also I'm kind of offended because why don't you call me a um, uh, leader of the lashkar e, uh, uh, lashkar -e leader? Why do I have to be a wife? So even in like trolling, I have no agency. Uh, so all of uh, this happened. And also, because I was not an employee and the editor had been changed, for the longest time, I, I wasn't paid for the story I did. I wasn't even reimbursed for all the travel that I did to Gujarat or to Punjab or to Assam. And I was, you know, it was a 14,000 word story, uh, the cover story, so many people had read and I was told that there is no digital contract to pay you. So I wasn't paid for like 10 months and right now the case is on but again I have no support from the organization. The organization doesn't even tell me that is, if there is a someone that they've received, the, received from the court or not and I have to like use my own money for the legal expense and to track that. So uh, that is the situation right now. And uh, is that because you're freelancing? Uh, is that the situation? Uh, because uh, definitely because I'm freelancing and also because uh, the entire tone of the publication has changed post the publication of the story. And that is something to do with the people in power and there's something definitely going on which we don't know about. So. Uh, yeah, so that is something that one needs uh, to... Maybe, Ritu, you can tell us more about this, maybe. But we have witnessed in the last two years, three years, um, editors, writers, reporters have quietly lost their jobs, very quietly are jobless, because they ran a story that was against the government. Uh, did you say three years? Uh, very difficult to map a pattern and... Uh, and I'm not saying, that's a good point because yeah. I don't think any government that I can remember has been innocent of this but in see, my 46 years of journalism. Yeah, but whenever there is, you know, uh, a change of government or a regime change uh, and we've seen one in India now after two, con you know, two long tenures of a particular government, uh, of course, you know, uh, journalists need to change gear and it does shake you out of your complacency because by that time uh, you're so familiar with everyone, you know, the ministers are on the cell phone with you and things like that. But it's also good. It's, it's good to jolt uh, journalists out of their complacency and I don't mean uh, they should either become compliant but yes, you have to change tack because uh, the rules of engagement have changed, uh, uh, tactics have changed, uh, the Prime Minister doesn't fly you on his plane anymore. Uh, Has so, what? No, like the Prime Minister, you don't go on the Prime Minister's plane. You know, uh, if you fly on Air India 1, it's a very good uh, place to make contacts with the people who matter. Uh, with the top that has been greatly reduced with this administration, right? Uh, sorry? That has been greatly reduced with this administration. No, it's been stopped. It's been stopped. So yeah. now if you have to cover the Prime Minister's uh, trips, you have to fly in yourself. Uh, you don't fly on the same plane as we used to. Mm. So I'm, all I'm saying is that so, um, uh, you know, uh, sources have changed, uh, terms of engagement, but rules basically of basically sources have dried up, haven't they? Very yeah. few people uh, give stories easily. And one thing, I, a question I want to ask all three of you is that how do you handle a plant 
because the first question uh, that I have always followed and I tell people who work with me is that when you get a plant, don't refuse it, but the first question should be why are you getting this plant and from whom and what is his motive? And how do you describe a plant? Yeah, first you, ex first you examine that before you use the plant. So, uh, Neha? Uh, as journalists, we always get information from some source or the other, but the next step always is, and I think all of us follow that, is that we obviously go and corroborate and we see what is, is there, is, is there some public good behind this? Is this person involved in this? You always, there is, there are different layers of corroboration, uh, uh, of checking and that is one something always does. For example, this story or some, uh, one previous story I had done again on children being trafficked by madarsas and then they were used in sweatshops by Spiker and Gap and all of that. So, there is, you get information, you cross-check it, there is a second layer. For example, for this story also, the somebody who told me was actually working in the area. So the motive may not necessarily be always negative or have a very, like, a strict agenda which is going to benefit the person who's telling you the story. So that is something that always happens. Michael? I agree uh, completely that it's just our responsibility to corroborate everything and to make sure that uh, what we're going to publish is, is the truth. And we have to, if we have any doubt that it's true, then we really shouldn't publish it. How do you deal with plants in Indian Express? Is no, there a policy? It's very difficult to define a plant. And, uh, but even if you're aware if it's a plant or there's a vested interest or a personal motive in the source giving you the story or the documents and the story is big, you go ahead and take it, you know. There may only be some uh, predictability about what other people think who may have given me the story, but that doesn't matter. Uh, and of course I agree, not only do you have to corroborate, you also have to verify authenticity of documents. Because um, there have been any number of occasions where I have got documents uh, and uh, you need to authenticate them right from the source in the sense uh, you may always not be lucky, you may not have the resources, uh, but sometimes you need to go to that file in the income tax authority and you find that the documents are interpolated. You know, where did these six paragraphs come from? They are not in the original document. Mm. So it's very tricky. Yes, it is. You know, to do the forensics, uh, legwork, yes, but also data forensics and authentication of documents. Yeah, well, you see Dan Ryder and uh, Mary Mapes got into trouble with that documentation uh, which they basically had to resign for. So one has to be extremely cautious. Michael, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I think the situation with Dan Rather and Mary uh, Mapes, it is a cautionary tale. And, uh, you know, I, uh, the, the same source that gave them the bad information came to the Globe uh, with yeah. some uh, similar information. and. Uh, he tried to tell us a story uh, that was very tantalizing about uh, President Bush, and it's a story that we would love to have put in the paper. And it was my job to check him out. And to my, uh, in my opinion, the story did not check out. Uh, and so, uh, obviously, we didn't publish a story. Mm. Then this uh, same individual, <clears throat> uh, he went to the New York Times, which, which did publish a story, inside, it was not on page one. And then uh, this same individual went to USA Today, and this story was a page one story in USA Today. So finally, I was in a position where I had to write the story that said, hey, wait a minute, uh, the Boston Globe, check this guy out, and the story's not true. Uh, uh, I, yeah, I have a similar example. I was working in office on a Sunday, and here comes a source with some great CBI documents. Anyway, I was busy and that's why I was in office on Sunday and I, uh, I, it's also not good to be pressurized to say the story must appear tomorrow or the story must appear because the Supreme Court is hearing the case. You know, it's not our job to influence the bench. But anyways, uh, so uh, I, I thought I'll verify the story on a Monday. Another newspaper published it uh, the next day. And very rarely does the CBI file a defamation case, but they did file it against this newspaper because the documents weren't authentic. They were not true. No. See, it's a risk you take because, for example, uh, Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky's story, Newsweek was sitting on it trying to identify their vo voices to ensure that they were factually correct before they published. And then Matt Drudge, who nobody knew of, 
before that time went went ahead and pub published it and it just blew into the biggest story of that uh, administration yeah i think particularly in this era <clears throat> of fake news and uh, this era when there's really a sharp uh, ideological divide in many countries it's it's especially important to check out stories and make sure they're not plants and to be accurate because if you fall for a, a false story that's planted, then it discredits, uh, it discredits the entire media. Uh, you know, I think uh, when something like the, the Dan Rather, Mary Mape situation happens, it lends credibility to, to people who say that uh, mainstream media is fake news. So it's, it's really, it's more important than ever uh, that we be accurate and uh, especially when we're looking at political stories where there are plants, uh, to be able to tell a legitimate source from a plant and make sure that we're not used uh, to publish a story that's inaccurate. Yes, Neha. Something that I wanted to add, and maybe uh, uh, we should also discuss this, that a lot of times when we do some stories, or let's say a long-form story, and we're trying to put things, facts on the table, they may not necessarily be a paper trail. So how does one, uh, you know, put things out there? For example, I'll give, I'll give an example. I'd done a story um, in September 2013 when the Muzaffar Nagar Shamli riots happened in North India. And one found out that uh, apart from all the communal violence and several people were maimed, raped, murdered, one found out after spending some time, say, 25 days in the relief camp, one found out that uh, in the compound of a specific village Pradhan, some 19 women were gang-raped, sodomized, and their family members were killed and maimed in front of their eyes. Now, this kind of information I got because I spent 25 days in the relief camp. And the organization that had commissioned the story, where I filed the story, they wanted the phone numbers of those women, those 19 women, to call them and uh, call them up and ask them if this has happened. Now, one thing, I cannot reveal who these women are because there's obviously some kind of confidentiality, uh, confidentiality involved. And the second thing is that these women, their houses have been burnt, they've been displaced, and they're living in relief camps and they do not have cell phones. So you cannot call them up and corroborate. And which is why, and because there was a, obviously a political angle behind it, because it was just a few months before the general elections in 2014, they held on to that story, and eventually, after, the story was filed on 25th September. I had to eventually withdraw and give it to Outlook, and it was published on 31st December. Now, the thing is that for a story like this, how do you establish any kind of paper trail? Yes, you can look at my notebook. You can see the kind of notes I have taken. But to demand these ki this kind of, you know, this put a template method to corroborate is also sometimes a trap. And which is why, because the story was published late, a lot of them could have got help from all the national human rights, uh, uh, from the teams from Human Rights Commission or the National Commission for Women or various other fact-finding fact groups that were going there. They did not get any help. So maybe that kind of template uh, to corroborate things is also something that has to be addressed more frequently. Let me put it the other way around now. Have any of you been put under pressure to publish a story that you are not totally sure or comfortable with? Because the editor is excited about putting it out and you say, nah, -uh, I'd rather wait and check this and this. Has that happened to you? Michael? Because there are editors who are trigger happy. Oh yeah, there really are. And I, I guess I'm fortunate. You know, the story that I just mentioned that uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, in the uh, <clears throat> Air Force Reserve uh, tried to plant on us. I mean, this is a very tantalizing story. Uh, this, this, uh, the man who came to us uh, said that when George Bush was governor, his top aides had destroyed, came to the, came to the base and destroyed his uh, Air National Guard records. And, uh, you know, I think an editor who was uh, less experienced might have put a lot of pressure on me to publish this story. But my editor said, why don't you just find out if this guy is telling the truth? And when I decided that he wasn't telling the truth, I mean, that, that was the end of it. Now, as I said, some other very uh, reputable newspapers did publish the story, 
and maybe there was there was pressure from the editors to get something in the paper. You know, this uh, this plant came around. He was very shrewd. This was uh, just before the election, and when you are in the period uh, just before an election, I call it the crazy time because uh, news organizations nobody wants to get scooped, and so there's a lot of pressure to get scoops, and there's a lot of pressure to make sure you don't get scooped by anyone else. So it's a great time for a plant to come along with a fake story because people let their guards down and people start going with one source. I mean, when, when the New York Times published this story, when USA Today published this story, they were going with a single source uh, that appeared to be credible because he was a, a retired colonel, but in fact, uh, he was telling a tall tale. Ritu, what about you? Have you regretted rushing into, a, uh, into publishing a story which later turned out to be a little iffy or totally iffy? I oh, know that's uh, investigative journalism is not about hurry and uh, neither is it about file pinching, you know. Uh, so that's, uh, that's not the genre at all uh, we deal with. And if I'm not convinced about a story, uh, one, I don't think I would be required to work on it. And it will not certainly go against my name. I can assist someone with it, but yes. uh, there's no question of anyone forcing me. Neha, would you like to add something? So, uh, I have an example of a, uh, where actually I didn't want the story to go at that point. This was, story in, uh, this was a story in August 2014 where this video came out where uh, the news was that one woman was uh, a victim of love jihad and she was uh, gang raped inside her madarsa and there was some organ trafficking and the video had some cuts on her body. And I, uh, so Al I was doing this story for Al Jazeera where the whole deal was to actually go and corroborate and talk to this woman whether, quote unquote again, it's, if it's a case of love jihad or not. Where, when I met the girl inside, in, in her house, she openly said that she was seeing a Muslim boy and she was aware of the Muslim identity of her boyfriend. And in that duration, she, uh, she got pregnant and she had an ectopic pregnancy and which is why she had to go to the hospital and get operated. And obviously the family did not know. And because there was a local, there was a lot of pressure locally because there was a Muslim uh, person was elected as the village Pradhan and he had changed the gate of the mosque. And which is why the entire, uh, the Hindu community is ki was kind of upset for that reason. And which is why some political uh, groups uh, who were uh, affiliated with some Hindutva organizations came and bribed the father to make her say this. When I met her, she said nothing of that sort has happened. And uh, I came back, I was writing that story for Al Jazeera. But the point was, had I published that story then, her life would have been in danger. So just, it was one of those rare occasions when I uh, got in touch with the Al Jazeera editor and I said, could we wait and not publish the story now and let some activists get her out of her house so that once the story is published, her life is not in danger. And thankfully, the Al Jazeera editor uh, uh, took this into account and delayed the publication of the story. It's, it's a very difficult and careful decision one has to assess and also when you're under pressure that somebody else may also get the story, you want to get it out first, especially if you worked on it for a while. I do remember in the 80s when um, uh, Rajiv Gandhi first came into power and there was a this thick dossier, I think you're all too young to know, you are probably not born then, but there was a this thick dossier given to a lot of journalists around the city and I was on a friend's desk and I started looking at it, he showed it to me and he said, we're going to publish this. So I said to him, you know, the pub story is not that they ordered pillows from Switzerland and uh, silver bowls from somewhere else or whatever, because the whole it the story was the, an item itemized renovation of the plane, the prime minister's plane, and all the luxuries that were now being put in uh, according, according to this whole document. I told him, I said, the real story is, who gave you this story and why? But that was too much work. That was just too much work to go tracing like, okay, you gave me the story, but what, who gave it to him from Air India to plant it with all the journalists? Now that takes a little bit of digging. Meanwhile, everyone in the, all the news organizations published that story with, oh, how insensitive of them in a poor country to be buying these kind of things and renovating this plane into a luxurious sort of affair.
Yes, Ritu. That happens now also. You uh, get to know that some documents are doing the rounds, you know, and that a bunch of editors, not only yours has them, or it's not only you, some other reporters also have them, and everyone waits to see who bites first. Yeah, I see. Now, now that it's out in the open, we can talk about it. Robert Vadra's, do the, that story was sitting on numerous news organizations' desks, but the Congress Party was in power and nobody had the guts to run it. Finally, in frustration, it was given to Arvind Kejriwal, who then had a press conference, and then all the journalists shot over his shoulder. So much for our bravery. But we do good stories. I mean, Ritu's an example, so is uh, Neha and Michael. So I think we'll take the floor now for questions. What happened to the story? You didn't uh, uh, complete it. Did those girls get saved at the end? Government's proactive was visible in the fact that they registered a case against me instead of going and finding out what happened to those girls, which is amazing. But the good news is that out of those 31 girls, six are back and hopefully some should be back in the next few months. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I run this platform called uh, <clears throat> Janki Bath, which gets a lot of uh, stories from the citizen. Uh, so we had this story during the whole demonetization thing of how a 70-30 racket was going on in the black money. So there were people who were very uh, involved with the system who were uh, changing the old notes with the rate of 70-30 which was going in the market and we tapped that. And we went with the story to every news organization and none of the news organization was willing to uh, put it up. Now we are a very small organization with a million viewership but only 15 months of uh, inception. So in this scenario, if I take investigative journalism, so how do uh, outlets which have just begun uh, operations uh, <clears throat> do not get that support from a bigger entity, how do they venture into investigative journalism, right? Because we had threat, we had calls that, okay, please do not release this story, this is something which can harm you. Then uh, finally we released that on a platform right now, but it did not get that level of traction which it could uh, get at that time. Did you so, take it to the Indian Express? Uh, we did, uh, I did email to uh, Nand Gopal or someone uh, on the ID and uh, I, they said that they would not carry out the story. So I have that email also. But maybe the story had some holes, did it? Uh, so they, uh, in, if the story has the holes, then I think the, uh, the bigger players should basically say that, okay, fine, there is some merit in the story. You get in touch with one of our reporters and let's try to dig more. Because I dig to a level where there was a racket which was working through uh, Dubai where the certain gold bars involved in a secretary for political party was also involved in uh, chasing it. I had scheduled a meeting with that respective black money agent. Her name was uh, Lucy Nanda who stays somewhere uh, near Rohini. Uh, but uh, <coughs> the fact is that uh, I needed some more resources in order to dig it out. So and my question is this investigative journalism for smaller platforms which is tru uh, truly independent, it needs a bit of support from bigger entities is my uh, just a comment and a question. Uh, there are some organizations but mostly abroad that uh, help and sustain this kind of freelance uh, investigative journalism. I don't think anything has come up in India as yet. But generally speaking, uh, an organization would be wary of taking, uh, picking up data from a freelancer uh, because of the legal issues involved. If, uh, you know, an organization, if, the, if there are legal uh, cases subsequently, uh, then it's better, it's an ideal situation where you have to defend a staffer uh, rather than a freelancer. Yes, but if the organization is commissioning a story and you are going out and working on it for four months and then you come back and you publish it and then you don't take onus. I mean, the, you, you just completely refuse to uh, do anything about it apart from the fact that it has been published, it continues to be on your website. In the last five years, you would see that there are the number of freelancers in the Indian media has increased uh, and one of the reasons is also because you cannot do stories for one organization and uh, the stories com continue to be killed and which is why a lot of uh, people my generation are moving to independent journalism and that is something when the story is being commissioned then this is something that this is a practice that should be incorporated by different Indian mainstream organizations. And I see news websites picking up a lot of... Yes. Uh, you know, uh, high risk, low risk, but risky stories. Uh, a lot yeah. of them are picked up by the but website. I think I think it's important to for website to follow the same uh, sort of ethical guidelines and journalistic codes to ensure because I mean one bad story can just destroy your 
credibility. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Uh, you know, the, the way we work with freelancers who come to the Globe Spotlight team with stories, but the way we do it is that we won't publish the story by the freelancer, uh, even if we read it and we think it's pretty good. What we'll do is we'll take that freelancer and have him work with one of the reporters on the Spotlight team, and they'll go over the story together and essentially uh, do a story that's uh, more authoritative and something that we all have total total confidence in. Uh, so we, we will work with freelancers, but when I say uh, work with them, I mean really work with them uh, to make sure the story is as, as powerful as it can be and as credible as it can be. And if we don't think it's 100% credible, we will just say, sorry, we, we, we can't publish. My question is, uh, when you do publish a story, an investigative story, like let's say the SR papers, and when you see there's no impact that the story really makes in terms of heads rolling, or you know, court cases or government investigation. How do you deal? Do you still follow up, or do you just move on? You don't do you know you don't do, uh, do stories for impact, but yes, impact does become important. Uh, so next morning you may think, oh my story is sunk, uh, or you know, depending on uh, whether it's trending or. But I really don't go because there's no way to measure impact. Also, you know. Um, the impact of the story could be what is uh, that the cabinet discusses it uh, the next morning, or you know you may find out that uh, the uh, intelligence agencies have moved a note because of your story. I mean, impact Sometimes can be measured in so many also. ways, not only by Twitter trends. All right, go ahead. Um, so make it quick, then we can give her a chance. Sure. So I've I've just recently moved into journalism from law, and I would love to look at trying to get into investigative journalism, but. How do you do that if you're literally just you, you're just absolutely fresh into it? You're trying to figure out figure your feet out. What what, adv what advice would you guys have for trying to get into investigative journalism and trying to make a success of it? Um, I mean, obviously, Ritu has worked for a long time. How do you look at things like getting into the ICIJ? Well, it, you know, it's not really that easy to get in investigative uh, reporting. I mean, we have a lot of people who come to the Globe and, and they say, I want to work in the Globe Spotlight team. And it, it's never happened. I mean, we won't put someone on the Globe Spotlight team unless they've already worked at the Globe in a different position. And that's because we want to see if they're, uh, we want to see how good they are, we want to see if they're reliable, and we also want to see them break a few stories on their own before they come to the Spotlight team. So I think if you're going to do investigative reporting, uh, it's good to have a track record of, uh, of breaking stories before you take on a, a big project. Uh, you know, I think if you're going to do long-form, uh, high-impact investigative reporting, you need to develop a track record as a solid, uh, reliable reporter before you take on really big subjects, I think, and, and work with uh, an investigative news organization. Unless you come in as an intern. I mean, that's another way to do it, where you get, uh, you know, you're an intern and you get some uh, experience just by being around the investigative reporters, and maybe you uh, do some research and you kind of gradually work your way into it. See, journalists are there to uh, reveal the truth to the public, and that's what they specialize in, and the public has learned to trust their favorite journalist and columnist. My, my subject of interest and, and uh, passion is rape and the growing incidence of rape, and uh, why is it that it continues to grow? Okay, that's a cultural thing, whatever it is, it's hard to get to. Why is it that with all the rapes and the most tragic, horrific stories we read about, why is it that the journalist's work, which seems to proceed, in, and, and it's a lot more superior than the police or the hospital work that follows, has not been able to get the rapists exposed? And by now, with the amount of the, the incidents that are happening, surely the journalists would have formed an opinion of how to, 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 to get to the mind of the rapist and reduce the incident of rape by revealing who they are and where they come from and forming a character that, that could really start to turn around the, the, the numbers that are growing. I work with this area, so for me it's a great concern. And why do we always protect the face of the rapist? I think the more rapists that get revealed in the public, the more shameful their families and they will feel and reduce the number of rapists. Why do we always protect them? We you never see a face of a rapist, but they will easily reveal the face of the, the, the victim. 
so i would i would give a generic answer which is not particularly only limited to journalists but also there is what you're suggesting of course that needs to be done but at the same time a lot of times what happens is that if the rapist is from a particular uh, socio economic background a lot of people have gone and done those uh, stories and uh, done a profile around those rapists and in the process what they have done which is really bad is that you have actually profiled an entire community which happened for instance in the nirbhaya case where some somebody went and profiled the entire uh, uh, jugi in south delhi and said here are the people and this is what they uh, this is how the rapists live and this is what they did and that kind ha- kind of had a uh, larger ramification for the people living in that entire slum so there is al- also that danger and the other thing is that all these rapists are from different so there is not one kind of rapists the rapists are there from different kinds of backgrounds they may be super elite they may be upper middle class they may be from the working classes and therefore which is why why you are saying something saying that it is right but it also needs to be done in a very responsible way and in the way it has been done in the uh, done in, since 2012 it's it's not really responsible it's actually profiling an entire community and calling them criminals and that is i think something that needs to be avoided okay i want to thank it's been an honor to sit on the same dais as ritu sarin michael renandes and neha dikshit thank you very very much <laughs>